The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Daily Racing Forum handicapping session about Keeneland's opening day. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, joined today by DRF's own Dan Illman. Dan, how are you doing today? Doing great, Pete. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. Spring is in the air, opening day at Keeneland. And we've got two very good three-year-old turf horses in the feature race. Oscar Performance, of course, winner of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. He's a front runner. And then you've got a gigantic late kicker in Chad Brown's Ticonderoga. That horse has immense potential. He's been looking pretty good, and I'm very curious to see that return to the races. That's one of the races we'll be talking about today. Um, we're going to be not only going over this Keeneland opening day card, Dan, but we're also going to be demonstrating some of the tools that we use when it comes to analyzing form, talking about specifically Formulator, of course, but also the Time Form US uh, product, which is going to be a new thing to many of the folks watching, but hopefully we can get them on their way. I don't know about you, Dan, but I find those two programs extremely helpful when used in conjunction with one another. Is that the way you approach it as well? Agree a thousand percent, uh, especially Formulator, Timeform US with their uh, figures and their pace projector, I think is great. And just sort of breaking down a race from a pace standpoint, giving you a virtual snapshot of how the race is going to be run. And Formulator, especially at Keeneland, as we're going to see in the, the opening race on the opening day uh, with two-year-old Maiden's uh, trainer stats, very, very valuable. And Formulator's got them all for the last five years. Fantastic. Yeah. And that ability to even dive deeper and look at each runner that's been sent out in those five years. It's uh, you can't help but learn something when you spend some time. The only thing, and I always caution people about this when you're using formulator, you are in danger of going down a rabbit hole and spending half of your afternoon looking up form on horses you remember running from four years ago. So just be careful. Don't don't dive in there unless you have uh, a little bit of time if you're doing that type of research. But it, it's, it's really a fantastic tool. Tool. Uh, let's start off. Uh, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. And in this case, we're looking at a maiden special weight race going four and a half furlongs, the kind of race Keeneland is known for. Two year olds. Uh, this field has a little bit of an unusual look to it, Dan, in the fact that we have uh, an assortment of entries. Let me ask you a general question because, of course, in addition to all the fantastic work you do at DRF, you're also an author. And many moons ago, you wrote a book about betting maidens and two-year-olds specifically. How do you approach a race like this? Well, there are three uh, factors, I think, that all handicappers have to look at. Uh, first and foremost, trainer. You're going to have certain trainers, and we're going to see that in the case of the opener at Keeneland, that just win with first-time starters, and there are some trainers that like to give their horses a race or two. And when you look into Formulator, you're going to see that some guys excel, and some guys just don't win, and you don't want to back short price horses with trainers that just don't win with these kind of horses of course then you also have pedigree there are some sires their best progeny you know excel at distance of ground with maturity a mile a mile and a sixteenth a mile and an eighth is three-year-olds and then there are some sires they are they get precocious fast two-year-olds that's obviously what you're looking for in a race like the opener at Keeneland. And then there are the workouts, and we're uh, pleased at DRF to have a workout report at Keeneland. Uh, we've got the Welsh Terrell Works, and they are in now for opening day at Keeneland. So we do have some insights on how these horses are running, and you really want to look at those workouts, the eyes and ears. Um, you're looking for, for information that's not in the form. Everybody's got the time. Everyone's going to be uh, excited excited about any kind of fast bullety workout but if you get these little details that are in those Keeneland workout reports it's really going to help you uh, get a piece of the horse's quality. I love that point you can see who a horse has been working with that can offer you a clue when you see a younger horse working with a talented older horse maybe or for a horse who's never run and you get a sense that they're working equally in quality up to a horse who has run you might look at that horse who has run look at the speed figures that horse is capable of maybe that gives you just a little bit of insight into what you can expect from this first time starter um I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the workout report specifically for this race, Dan, but are there any, uh, and, we're, and we're certainly not going to give away the store either, but are there any tidbits that leap out to you when looking at this first race of, of Keeneland from this debut edition of the Welsh and Terrell Keeneland Spring Racing Clocker Report? 
couple of horses caught the clocker's eyes. The number six, Just Be Frank, who just from a timing standpoint, some very fast workouts of 46 and three breeze out of the gate on March the 30th. Um, far superior in this team drill, leaving mate Carquette several lengths behind. So that's a very nice uh, comment on the six, Just Be Frank. And the number 10, Fairyland, one of two entered for trainer, uh, Wesley Ward. I like the comment here, robust bodied miss caught the eye while seeming to have run in reserve breezing outside of stablemate Ultima D. These are just the kind of comments you're going to get for the entire card, the entire meet with the Keeneland Clocker Report. Yeah, that's yeah, very, that's very cool. cool. Um, um, I have a little have technical a little thing going on here. here. Let me fix that. The first time I'm ever, uh, I'm ever trying to uh, run one of these things. I should have also mentioned before, Dan, that there is a uh, there is a way that folks can ask questions if you're new to these webinars. There's a you can see the tool on the side there, and you can submit your questions. And if we have some time at the end, we'll get to those. But let's talk about that other factor you mentioned. One of those other major factors in these races, trainers and how you can use trainer stats to help guide your way in these races where you don't have any form lines to look at. And there's a little shortcut in Formulator 2 that we might want to demonstrate. Why don't we start out by taking a look at Wesley Ward? Wesley Ward is the king of the two-year-olds in these four-and-a-half furlong maiden special weight, the traditional races during the Keeneland Spring meet. And if we look in Formulator at Wesley Ward over the past year, and this would be the last spring meet, if you go by two-year-old first-time starters on dirt, four-and-a-half furlongs at Keeneland, you'll see that he wins a lot. <laughs> Five for 11, that's 45%. Now, the ROI is not going to be strong because everyone knows that Wesley Ward brings live two-year-olds to Keeneland. But it just seems very foolish to try to take a stand against this horse unless you know something. Unless there is a – Harvey Pack like to say, watch the board. But Harvey would always point out that – when you mention watch the board, when Wesley Ward is 6-5, to five, you're not saying, wow, Wesley Ward is live. Of course he's going to be betting these races. Or if Todd Pletcher takes money or Chad Brown, you're looking in a race like this to see, is Carl DeVille taking money? Is William Helmbrecht 5-1 to one or 6-1? to one? Because that could be significant in the teeth of a heavy favorite. So when you're watching the board, you're not exactly watching for Wesley, but you're watching for lower profile trainers that are taking money. That being said, Ward's numbers are exceptional with these kind of horses. Fairyland is the 10. Kitty Cat Kate is the 8. They are both fillies going against Colts. I do not worry about that this time of the two-year-old's development. And Ward has won with fillies against Colts in these situations in the past. Uh, of the two, I guess I prefer Fairyland, who cost a lot of money for the cool more people. And the dams a half to Agnes Digital, who's a very good horse in Japan, a grade one winner on both dirt and turf. There are the numbers you spoke of, Dan, that, uh, that 5 for 11 locally with the Firsters. That's, that's not necessarily a trend that you want to be, uh, be bucking, I'll say that. And the point you made about Phillies, I just wanted to underline that I think this early in their careers, because Phillies are lighter framed, they're actually easier to get fully fit than Colts are, I've had horsemen explain to me. So I would definitely not, uh, in, in these two-year-old races in general, consider that a negative. The Phillies, if anything, might have a little bit of an advantage at this time of year. And right, even if you're not going to be able to accept the price on these ward runners, it's probably a good idea to know that he has this level of success, just so you don't necessarily spend too much money going in um, – going in and trying to buck these horses. Now let's compare Ward to, uh, to some of the other trainers in this race and how they do with first-time starters. Um, anyone in particular we should uh, take a peek at? Well, I mean, even if you just look in your uh, formulator past performances, uh, not even diving into formulator, you see that a lot of these guys – they're not exactly known for winning first time out. Wayne Rice 0 for 7, Marco Castaneda 0 for 8, William Helmbrecht 0 for 16, William Brumley 0 for 1, 0 for 9, 0 for 7, etc. These are guys that oftentimes are going to start horses in these four and a half furlong race, and they have the misfortune to start against Wesley Ward. William Helmbrecht is the trainer of the number six, Just Be Frank, a horse that got that positive workout comment from the uh, Welsh Terrell team and has those fast workouts on display. If we go into formulator and we check past five years, first-time starters, he is one for 53. 
That is not a good number, obviously. A lot of those races have come on synthetic surfaces, and the great thing about formulators, you can also break them down on dirt, where he is 0 for 11. Um, this is a guy that does not win with first-time starters. Perhaps this horse will uh, take some money based on the workout report, but it's always something that should be in the back of the mind. Maybe just be frank, we'll need a race. Now, you made the point about Harvey and how he used to talk about what money was meaningful, and that's a great point. You'll sometimes see a horse, a Wesley Ward at eight to five could be cold on the board, and uh, a Carl DeVille at eight to one could be warm on the board. And it's one of those things. And, and I hate to say it, it's, it's not much nicer when we can say, hey, when thing A happens, it definitely means uh, thing B. But this is one of those things that involves a lot of feel and a lot of getting, uh, getting familiar with your circuit before you can really know what everything means. But it's a great area, I think, to pay attention to, the, the sort of wisdom of the crowd. For me, it means a lot when you're dealing with first-time starters. It means a lot when you're dealing with layoff horses because that money, it's, it's uh, money in, in horse racing, it, it can be noise. But in this case, it's signal because when you have as little to go on, the people betting that money, presumably they're, they're, they're not just you know throwing it out there. It, it has some significance. And over time, you can just add that to be another tool in your handicapping arsenal. Uh, I think we're going to very quickly, Dan, look at this second race, if I'm not, unless you had any final thoughts on the uh, on the curtain jerker before we, before we move along. No, I guess if we would have to mention one other horse, again, I prefer the 10 Fairy Town, maybe the three Baytown Lex in Formulator. Trainer Paul McEntee over the past five years with first-time starters is zero for 37. But perhaps giving hope for this horse is if you look in Formulator, one of the third-place finishes was a horse that debuted here last year named Baytown Turles, who was 32 to 1 and finished third in that race, easily outrunning his odds. I wonder if this horse, Baytown Lex, with a couple of bullet workouts at the Thoroughbred Center, will outrun his odds for McEntee, a trainer that doesn't win very often. But it's Ward's world, and I'm not going to try to put too much money in against him. All right, let's move on to the second race. And this may be a quick conversation. This is a case where just taking a quick look through the field, you see a horse who has a clear speed figure advantage. Of course, we're talking about uh, number two, Rhodium, for Mike Piazza, not that Mike Piazza. And then one of the things you might look at with a horse who has a figure advantage to try to poke holes is, well, maybe the pace doesn't set up for this horse today. And this is where the time form pace projector that you mentioned before um, can become a very useful tool in our arsenal. And I'm going to go ahead and navigate. If folks aren't familiar with time form, this, the, the tool that I'm using at the top is how you can navigate from track to track. And we'll move to Keeneland opening day, and we'll take a look. And this here in the upper right-hand corner is the pace projector. If you click on it, it becomes larger. And we see not only they have three pace designations for the pace projector. There's this one, favors horses on or near the lead, early lead. There's a neutral one where you wouldn't see anything there. And then there's one that indicates a fast pace. So this one's indicating that a horse in this race or horses on the lead are going to have an advantage. And here we have Rhodium, several lengths clear. If you look in the little snapshot here, you can see that quantified in a number with, rated as a 114 early pace as opposed to the next uh, closest pursuer of an 89. And for me, Dan, that just, it, another one of these situations where you know I'm not necessarily in a hurry to, to bet on this three to five shot, but I'm probably not going to want to spend a whole lot of money trying to beat the horse. Is this a case of single and move on? Is it a case of pass or do you have something clever in here? If it's not single or move on, it's weigh very, very heavily and move on. Uh, not only does the horse have a clear pace edge, not only is the horse in the start form, which is the same four of his last five starts, he has won well at Keeneland in the past, which I think is very important. I think Keeneland is one of those tracks where you want to see horses that have run well. It is a horse for course track, whether it is dirt or turf. Rhodium ran second here and a good second during the fall meet. But also, if you look at the time form speed figures, I mean, not only is the horse a tremendous edge on the buyer edge, but if you click on Rhodium on the left hand uh, sort of scroll, uh, you see his last time form US figure is a 104. And then you quickly click on every single other horse in the race, the best last number is an 84. So he has a 20 point last time form US fig. He has a clear advantage. He has the figs on the buyer. And he actually ran very, very well against arguably better horses last time out at Oakland Park. 
where he was dueling throughout. He was very game second to the favorite who came from off of the paces. And two horses have already come out of that race, both to run second with solid buyers of 78-79, sort of validating his 79 buyer. He is doubtlessly the horse to beat. We will show that feature you were talking about, Dan, that ability to look deeper into the field, but I'm not going to demonstrate it on this horse because I think we have a couple of places to do so later. In fact, we have some two places perhaps to do that here in race three, which will segue to this uh, optional claimer 83rd level allowance race going a mile. And uh, where shall we start here? Which, which, which one of these old races should we look into? Well, let's start with the number five, December 7, who's the morning line favorite at two to one. I have to admit that I usually do not like playing fairgrounds shippers. For one reason or another, I believe that maybe the fairgrounds buyer speed figures are a little bit inflated. And when they come over, they ship out at fairgrounds. Sometimes they're underlays. Uh, you see a lot of the fairgrounds jockeys come over to Keeneland, and they're very, very good. They're riding the Keeneland horses, and their numbers aren't good. James Graham, for example, last a year at Keeneland Spring and fall was three for 95. And I just wonder if these fairgrounds horses, they find it tough sledding when they come out of here. So I'm not sure I completely trust these numbers. But that being said, December 7's last race was the grade three mine shaft handicap. And if we look in Formulator, we're going to see that the mine shaft has already been an extremely productive race. The winner, Honorable Duty, came back and he was just extremely game to win uh, last week in the New Orleans handicap, getting up in the, the shadow of the wire with a big buyer speed figure. December 7's got good tactical speed. This is a horse, again, that has run well at Keeneland in the past, has run well enough away from the fairgrounds. That makes me think he's a very logical contender in here, albeit at a short price. Do I completely trust him? No. Do I have to use him in multiple race wagers? Yes. Let's have a look at some of the different views you can put on the charts. I've already switched it with this window up here to next race. That's where you can see the information that uh, Dan was just talking about. Another interesting way to get a snapshot of the form of a race is to go to the buyer speed figure view. I always think this is interesting way to get a line on form to look here under chart is what the horses ran in this race. And then you can see what each horse ran in his or her next race. And in this case, you see the form held, hold, held up very, very well with horses either um, increasing, decreasing. I mean, on, international start decreased somewhat significantly. But you look at the rest of the field and they're running the same number or a little bit higher. To me, when you see that, especially with the winner, the winner coming out of the race, that's something that's going to tell me um, that the, the form of that race is live and it's something that should be paid, paid attention to. Uh, another horse I thought was worth taking a little bit of a look into the past race was number one, Money Flows. And we can click on this race from uh, Sam Houston and we can see uh, right away, just looking at the list of names, the, the italics mean that the, those horses came back to win. But sometimes for me in 2017, a key race just isn't about did horses come back and win? Because there's always the question of, well, they won, but were they dropping? How was the field they were facing, et cetera, et cetera. I really like looking at it in the context of the speed figures they earned. And when you click on here, you can see once again, form that held up well. Horses repeating their numbers, um, and you throw in the fact that there are a couple of winners, and you have a horse coming out of a of a live race. What do you think in terms of playing this race, Dan? Are the are these the two that we want to use? Is there anywhere else you'd want to go? There's one other horse that I'm a little bit interested in, and that is rated R Superstar, a horse that has run well at Keeneland, most notably when third in the grade one breeders futurity behind Brody's cause as a two-year-old. My main concern with rated R Superstar is that this is a horse that as his career has progressed, seems better as a one-run closing sprinter. And now he's going to have to stretch out around a two-turn mile here at Keeneland. He does have the class and the back races to win. Heck, he is a graded stakes winner sprinting. That carry back just jumps off the page from last summer. But I'm not sure I completely trust him around two turns. I look at this race, and I think the five and the one are the right horses. I do not love them. I don't want to have too much money uh, in on them. Maybe the number four Egyptian is a horse that you can try to sneak in there at a price. He's just a really hard hitter, but his best races have come at the fairgrounds. And again, I do have a little bit of concern of horses shipping out of the fairgrounds uh, when they uh, run at Keeneland. 
I should point out for newer viewers, Formulator is a fully customizable program. I thought just to demo it today, I would limit the number of running lines we were seeing on the screen for the ease of being able to scroll back and forth. But of course, when I'm using this, and Dan, I think you're the same way, when you're using this for your own work, you can have this where you have the entire lifetime PP and you can print it out that way. Or something I'll also sometimes do for printing to save lines, I'll print out this view with maybe five lines back in there. And then when it comes to uh, doing my actual work on the screen, I will increase it to where we have all. So it's sort of like the best of the best of both worlds. Um, and uh, that's something that's very important to know about Formulator. You can, you can customize it to suit your individual handicapping needs. If you're the kind of player who wants to integrate workouts into the running lines, you can do that um, at the click of a button. You can also look at it in a more traditional view. However, you want to, uh, however you want to see your PPs, Formulator gives you a leg up on doing that. Let's move on, Dan, to the fourth race. This is a fifty thousand dollar maiden claimer, and the horse that I wanted. My, sometimes the way to use Formulator is you'll look over some PPs and a question will pop into your head and formulator can give you a chance to answer that question. And for me, the question I had when looking over this field is how does Todd Pletcher do when going from maiden special weights to maiden claimers? I'm a believer that trainer stats are best not accessed in a vacuum. I always like to have a sense of what a trainer's baseline numbers are before I look at a particular uh, more in-depth trainer statistic. So the way you establish a baseline, extremely simple. You see the blue hyperlink name of the trainer. Click on that. And in this list, you'll see over here to the left, that's going to be every runner that Pletcher's run in the last five years. There's a lot of them. That's why that took a second to pop up. But in terms of this baseline I was talking about, the two numbers I really look at more than anything else are simply win percentage and in the money percentage. So in this case for Pletcher, we're looking at 24% in the money overall, 54% in the money. Spectacular baseline. You struggle to find too many better than that. So then we click on our modify filters and we go and look for uh, under is it under class moves? Yes, we have the drop down here of different class moves we can search for. Maiden special weight to maiden claimer. We tell it okay, and you'll see we we already had a fabulous baseline, and now we're going up, up, up. An incredible thirty five percent winners, sixty five percent in the money, and a plus return on investment on your two dollar bet. This tells me once again, uh, not a horse I'm looking. Uh, or certainly not in a hurry anyway to, to buck here. Uh, where did you go in this race, Dan? Well, looking at Wissam and those trainer stats are gaudy indeed. My only issue with a horse like this is if it looks like a skunk and smells like a skunk, sometimes it's a skunk. And Wissam <laughs> sold for $100,000 as a weanling and made his debut in a race that featured Patch, who came back, uh, you know, and has become a, a solid enough three-year-old for Todd, ran very well in the Louisiana Derby. But this horse took no money and did no running. And maybe it's quite possible that he can't run at all. And because of the trainer stats that we see, and, and we must respect those trainer stats, and we must always respect Todd, this horse is going to take money. Yeah. He has found a spot where if he can run at all, he's supposed to be able to win. But it makes me think he's going to be way less than the four to one morning line. And uh, I might take a, a little bit of a swing against him. The logical horse from a fig standpoint is the number one roused about. But I have to be honest, I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. Yes, he ran well in a maiden cellar the only time he was in for this tag, but he was also beaten at four to five. And as a nine time starting maiden, I'm not sure how much improvement is there. I guess I would use roused about, but the horse I'm interested in is the number two. Summer 054. Uh, his most recent race, he broke terribly. It was his first start going a mile for Dale Romans after a promising enough sprint in for a tag, and he just broke in about three paths, was bumped very, very hard, ended up tracking in the four path on the turn, and finished evenly. This is a very green horse. It appears he does not know how to run, but I also think he wants distance being by Summer Bird, and this is going to be his first start uh, around two turns. I'm really interested to see what we get out of Summer 044. I wonder if there's a little bit of upside here. So we have the trainer stat with Wissom. We've got the fig with roused about i guess those are the two horses to beat i don't love them maybe summer 054 is the right one for romans 
I like it. I mean, the point you make about the horse being green, sometimes, I mean, this is getting a little late in the game for that, I guess, as a four-year-old, but you can make the case, okay, when this horse figures it out, you can project a little bit of improvement. Just because a horse is green in the first couple starts doesn't mean the horse is always going to be green. I mean, sometimes it does, but is that part of the case for Summer 054? You figure maybe Dale Romans here in his uh, personal playground of Keeneland has a chance to get this one straightened out and figure out uh, what he's what is what he wants to be when he grows up, essentially? I think it's just time. I think it's distance. And I think most importantly for a horse like this is getting into a field where he can feel confident. And this is the kind of field where he should be a strong contender. But, you know, this is a race where nothing would surprise me because we talked about the maiden special to maiden claiming move for Pletcher. You've got hardly seen Slim in for a tag for the first time, Star in the making in for a tag for the first time, whole lot of luck in for a tag for the first time. Any one of these horses could certainly benefit from a move that a lot of horse players call the most powerful class drive up in racing, maiden special to maiden claiming. Again, not a race where I'd like to have a ton of money in. If I'm involved in a, in a multiple race wager, maybe Summer 054 to me offers a little bit of value. I think that maybe he'll, he'll figure it out. He showed a little bit of running in his debut. Last time out, a little bit of late interest. I think this horse needs to stretch out around two turns. Not sure Gulfstream really is his kind of track. That's a really speed-friendly sort of profile. This horse likes to relax and make one run. Wouldn't be the first Roman's horse to make that move from Florida to Kentucky and show better form. So some interesting ideas there. Let's move on to the fifth, the 10 dime claimer. I'm going to just hit you with a general handicapping question to start off here, Dan. And it concerns your morning line favorite, this five-year-old chestnut mare, delusional KK. When you see in the career box up here in the right, a line like this, 21, 3, 9, Four. Does that give you pause? Does that indicate that she might have some sort of a character flaw as a five-year-old mare? Or do you just say, you know what, she is what the numbers say she is, and, and she's one of the top contenders here? No, I think you look at that big nine and you're saying, I'm, I'm putting my money down and I, I'd like to have at least some sort of faith that this horse really wants to win. And I'm not sure Delusional KK wants to win. The race that she did win, the most recent one, was March of 2016. She got up by a head. You get a feeling that just that day, Brian Hernandez might have timed it just right. She beat a nice horse in Wheatfield. But it's not like she's really gone forward. Yes, it's her third start back off a layoff. Michelle Lavelle does great work. This horse is taking a big drop in class. There are a lot of logical things to point out to Delusional KK. For me, I don't know. Her two races since coming back off the layup are not great. This is a horse in need of a class drop, and I'm not sure she wants to win. If she goes off at two to one, she can beat me all day long. I would try to spread in this race and not use her. Where would you, uh, what numbers would end up on your tickets? This is the fifth, the start of the 50 cent uh, minimum pick six for our, uh, our sponsor, Keeneland. Where, uh, what numbers will grace your tickets? I'm actually a little bit interested in the number six, Princess Dinah. Uh, this is a horse that's coming off the claim. Uh, low profile connections, pretty much insure, I would think a decent price. And while she's run well on synthetic, I wonder if dirt's her surface. You have to go all the way back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven starts. That was the last time Princess Dinah stepped on the dirt. She won by seven. The race before that on dirt, she won again. Uh, it seems that she's right there in many of her races on dirt. Uh, her most recent race wasn't a good effort, but she caught a runaway, a turfway again over the synth. I wonder if Princess Dinah switching surfaces off the claim and cutting back in distance will get a little bit of pace to run at. I'm going to use her. I'm going to use the number eight smart kit who won last time out. I didn't like that she failed to change leads in that race at Turfway Park and is now coming off a little bit of a layoff. But you have to accept certain things when dealing with $10,000 claimers. Smart kit's the kind of horse that runs well fresh, and she also has proven dirt form as well. The number five in here, I'm not really sure what to do with I'm Extraordinary, and I'll be interested in your thoughts here because this is a horse that just looks like a synth specialist. She won last time out. She's four for nine on synth. She's got, I think, the best last buyer figure, but I'm not sure if she's a turf synth or she's one for 11 on dirt. I might use that one simply as a backup as sort of insanity insurance, but those might be the three that I would key in on in this race and try to beat the seven. I know a lot of folks are going to go to the nine, love this life. I think she's okay and she has speed, but I don't really see her race that, that's so fantastic on the page, and she might take money. You mentioned I'm Extraordinary in the breeding angle. Now, I haven't, I haven't previewed this one, but uh, let's hop over because Timeform on the breeding side offers a tool that might 
give us some insight. And if nothing else, we can demonstrate it. If you go to I'm Extraordinary here, and the snapshot will pop up. And then if you click on the breeding area, you can see breeding ratings for all three surfaces. And indeed, Dan, as you surmise, the synthetic rating uh, considerably higher than the dirt rating. So um, that's just another data point in that favor. But as you point out, if we're spreading, trying to beat a two to one favorite, probably a horse you'd want to be on uh, at least some backup tickets, I would think. Uh, I guess I would use this horse as a backup simply because she, she appears to be in sharp form. This isn't a race where I really want to go too deep. I think it's a race where I would fool around with a couple of horses. Um, I'm extraordinary. Looks interesting. A couple of these horses look interesting. I'm interested in the pace projector, and 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 you brought up the time form uh, pedigree race. Maybe in a race like this, where it's so wide open, you see it favors the horse on or near the early lead, and you've got the nine love this life. It figures to be up close, and you have I'm extraordinary. What about second hand justice? They have this horse who's twenty to one on the morning line, and it says this horse will be close to the pace. I don't know. Uh, I, I think this horse has run some decent races on dirt in the past. And if you think this horse can get away with a rather easy lead, maybe one to consider at a gigantic price. But for me, I wonder if Princess Dinah can overcome this pace projector. I think I would probably use the six and the eight. I would also use the five as a backup with the nine. I would try to beat Delusional KK. I like it. I like it. Let's move on to race six. This is the start of the pick five, a bet that's just been done incredibly well since its introduction at Keeneland. I know many horse players for whom this becomes the focus of their day um, and really cool race. I mean, we're talking about first level, this is old school, first level allowance, nine furlongs on the grass for three-year-old fillies. This is real harbinger of the proper spring type stuff coming up. Few interesting horses in here, Dan. Who should we look at first? I'm interested in the number two joust who goes out for Christophe Clement and is getting Lasix for the first time. And there are some there are some solid angles for uh, Clement in Formulator if we uh, click in there uh, about his ability to get a horse off of a, a Lasix switch and off of a layoff to be ready. Uh, I just went with, and I like to get as detailed as possible and sort of work backwards. Uh, past five years, three-year-olds on turf. Late switch to Lasix off a, a greater than 180 day layoff, and you're seeing 31% in a $2.57 ROI. I mean, that's some pretty impressive stuff considering that these horses have not run in a very long time. So Clement certainly gets them ready to fire. A uh, joust to me showed some ability as a two year old uh, filly for Robert Evans. And the most recent mate race, the Miss Grio, it was a yielding turf course, and it was a yielding turf course. That was a bog at Belmont on October the 2nd. And you're very familiar with the horse that won the race, New Money Honey, who of course came back to win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf. Joust showed some speed that day, but I don't really think she cared for the turf conditions. When she was confronted in the upper stretch, it appeared that she checked herself. That checked 1 16th. Usually when you see that in the small comment line, you're thinking, well, someone bumped her. She was in between horses. She was in tight. No, she caused her own problems. And I think it was just simply she did not handle that turf course. Clement's given her plenty of time. I think she's better with a target, and she should sit a really good trip under Leperu, uh, breaking from a, a good inside post position. I think Joust is a very strong contender in the first leg of this, uh, of this 50 cent uh, wager. I like it. The other one I wanted to use in here, the post is probably not ideal, though at the mile and an eighth, Rosario will have the entire length of the stretch to to negotiate. Uh, Lipstick City for Chad Brown. One of the things I wanted to show, another cool thing about the, the time form PPs, and this is something you know you, you can do in two seconds to look at just to get an idea uh, in, a, in a turf race, who the best closer might be. And you'll see here, Around the running style, they have these sort of composite early pace and late pace ratings. And that 104 uh, late pace that Lipstick City has been awarded sort of leaps off the page for me in looking at this. Now, the 5 to 1, being given the connections here, probably not super likely you're going to get all of that. But just a horse that I, I felt like was worth taking an extra look at. Uh, thought enough off the maiden win to throw into a grade three and then coming back at Gulfstream. And I think there was something, it was something interesting about this race. Oh, I was going to show in time form that maybe my theory was maybe just a little bit too close to the pace in there also, which flattened out the finish. 
you can see time form. These are the pace numbers that you'll see right in the running line. And these, um, these suggest uh, a pace that was a race that was inefficiently run, where these early numbers, these early pace figures are fast in comparison to the final time. And that's why they get coded red. I was willing to give Lipstick City another chance as well. Um, are we happy with these two, or did you have any other ones you wanted to mention or throw in for folks playing Keeneland's Pick 5 on Friday? I really think you said a mouthful with Lipstick City. I think the source is dirtied up, and I think she was uh, ridden all wrong last time out, too close to that fast pace yeah. in, a, in a race that produced a very nice horse in 55. I do think we should not give the number four Danceland short shrift, though, for Shug McGahee, because this is a horse with sort of a, a typical Shug move. Career debut, didn't really do much running. Shug doesn't win first time out. Came off the layoff, first time two turns, slight improvement, improvement last time out to win. There's one thing we know about McGahee trained horses. They just get better with experience and distance. She has a beautiful pedigree and like uh, the uh, the closer that you mentioned, the Chad horse, Lipstick City, this horse should get a favorable pace scenario according to the time form U.S. pace projector, which has it as a fast pace. That's right. So uh, looking at those best closers potentially in a fast pace race, not a, not a bad way to go and definitely one of the ways that I'd like to use the time form U.S. PPs and the formulator PPs in conjunction Junction. Let's move on to the seventh race. Um, here we have another maiden special weight. So you know what? I'm going to take a chance and I'm going to see if perhaps we can show folks what the Keeneland Clocker Report looks like if it's up and available for download. You'll see a banner there. I was able to click on uh, already purchased. You, if you haven't done that, obviously you'll have to go through the sales uh, procedure. And yeah, look at this. Boom comes right up. Now again, we're not not going to like linger over this too long for those of you watching at home. We're not we're not trying to give away the store here, but uh we'll scroll quickly down anyway just to give folks a sense of what this looks like. Dan from a clocker well, yeah, you go ahead. Just take a look at the six tiger eyes. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, the tiger eyes is very, very positive workout. A powerfully built disc Andrea Philly, never allowed to take the bit, seemed really comfortable with new, her new surroundings. I would urge anyone that reads the clock report, the ratings are great, but don't just read the ratings. Read the way that they write about these horses. You could tell by the way the write-up for Tiger Eyes came in, that the clock was very, very impressed by her work. That's a great point. You can't be just, I think some people want it again. It's the problem with handicapping. People, understandably, you want things to be simple. You want two and two to equal four. And sometimes it does, but then there's other times where a little more interpretation is required. And I would say there are B minus workouts where if you read the description, might impress you or give you reason to like a horse more than a B workout, depending on the specifics of the situation and the field that that horse is meeting. So it's, and, and then, you know, you can also feel free to take information from there and using the notes feature in formulator, embed it right in your PPs. Perhaps there'll someday be a day where we can actually get um, the full workout reports integrated with time form. These days you have to do that manually, um, but it's still something that's worth doing on a number of occasions, especially if you have a note about a horse, say, going seven furlongs, who the clocker indicates uh, might be a force when it comes time to go two turns. In that instance, you can make a horse note, and then that will show up right in your PP when that day comes. So it's something, uh, something that you want to consider doing to just enhance your knowledge of, uh, of racing in general, and it's a way that the clocker reports can point you in the right direction terms of specific horses you're interested in here, Dan, anything leap to mind? To me, there's kind of a moto horse in here, and that's the number seven, Pauline Revere, who is a six to one on the morning line. And we talked about looking in formulator and looking at that win percentage and in the money percentage. And we, of course, get excited when we see 40 percent, 75 percent, etc. But I also think you should compare and contrast a trainer uh, especially in a situation with Ian Wilkes. And if we go and formulate it, let's just look at Ian Wilkes' past five years, first-time starters, a very, very basic uh, formulator fact. He is eight for 230. 
clearly he does not crank his horses up to win first time out. This horse was 38 to 1. And when you watch Pauline Revere's debut, she wasn't ready. She broke out very badly. She was taken immediately back to the to the inside. She advanced on the turn, and she finished with a little bit of interest in a race that included Salty, who has now burst onto the three-year-old Philly Kentucky Oaks scene with her win in the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Now it's a second time start for Pauline Revere. So let's go and modify the filters past five years second start. It's 12%. It's 185. It doesn't leap off the page, but it's four times more of an effective move for Ian Wilkes than first time out. If Pauline Revere is four times more uh, better than her career debut, she's very likely to win this race, and I would expect her to run well. But the horse that I'm also going to use, and I, I might actually bet a little bit on, is the number 11 True Boots. For Kenny McPeak, who's been winning races the last few weeks, this horse just seems to be moving forward, or at least back to her career debut, where she chased Summer Luck, who's going to be in the Ashland on Saturday. I think her last two races were good. Two back, she was in against Our Majesty, who was the favorite in that race, and sort of ran away and hid. The last time out, she ran a good, solid third under Channing Hill. I think she's going to project for a nice trip. I like the seven for this horse. Her best race came at a one-turn mile. She's going to stretch out to the seven. So, for me, I think True Boot Boots and the seven Pauline Revere's where I would land. I like it. I like it. There was one other point I wanted to make just looking quickly at this race. And sometimes with Formulator, you won't have a data sample that is satisfactory to tell you anything. You see a horse like number one, another gal, adding both Lasix and Blinkers for Charlie Lapresti. And if you put that in Formulator, you'll get a sample of two or three horses and it's just not enough. So what I would suggest doing in that place, in that instance, is look at each of those factors individually, and it gives you an opportunity to, to get a, maybe a little bit more of a sense of if this is a move that a given trainer is going to be able to be uh, proficient with. I mean, this is just, this is a case of a long shot, but, and some might argue that the double makeover can actually be a negative, like throwing the kitchen sink at a horse to see what happens. But I was a little interested to see that Lepresti, if you just look individually at switch to Lasix, there are some positives in the numbers. And if you just look individually at blinkers, and you want to be careful there to go switch to on, there are some real positives in the numbers. So it just made me think, hey, inside post position, if we can trust, it can be very difficult at seven furlongs to break well and get out of there, but he bothers to reach out for John Velasquez, especially if it's a day where the where it seems a little bit kind to the inside at a very big number, maybe a horse to to throw in on a on a trainer stat there. Not a not a strong opinion, more of a horse I wouldn't necessarily want to get beat by. The other point being when you see a horse with a makeover like this, and then you can look in the workouts and see that since the last race. You have a comparatively impressive-looking workout here on the Keeneland training track. Maybe that's a sign that the new equipment is doing something right with the Philly. Post, less than ideal from seven furlongs, but just another one I thought was at least worth mentioning. Um, let's move on to race eight, Dan. Um, this is one where I think a lot of handicappers might be tempted to sort of take the two favorites and move on. You've got two horses on the morning line bet uh, suggesting that they're going to be bet well below the rest of the field but of course these are the exact spots where you can sometimes really find value in multi-race wagers precisely because of that idea of so many people just taking two against the field and moving on what did you make of this race I want nothing to do with Mudarami, the number three, who's nine to five, and I think a lot of folks are going to bet, and his merits seem very, very obvious on paper. In his debut, he ran against Unified, who was a great stakes winner and a very good sprinter miler for Jimmy Jerkins. This is a horse, though, that Kieran McLaughlin has had a whale of a time getting sound. After that race, he showed up at Keeneland. He was one to two. He was supposed to win. He got beat, and he disappeared. So something physically must have gone amiss. He returned off a long layoff at Gulfstream, and he was one to five against just the hungriest of fields. And he, he ran well, but he didn't change leads in the stretch. I wonder if that's a sign that something's bothering him. And then he disappears again. And I don't like the fact that there was a month between that February 18th and March 16th workout. This is a horse that has some ability, but he also has his share of problems. And I'm not sure I want to take a short price on that kind of a horse. To me, the most interesting horse in the race is the number four town classic, a horse that started his career on turf and synthetic and ran well. 
And he started on dirt for the first time at the Keeneland Fall Meet, and he just went against a field that's so much better than the horses he's going to be facing on opening day. And if we click on that October the 29th chart, we're going to see right away two uh, italicized horses next out winners. You click on Unbridled Outlaw. He came out of that race uh, to win at Churchill Downs with a 90 buyer speed figure. Uh, he's solid. You've got Eklas, who finished 10th in that race, came back to win at Aqueduct with an 88 buyer speed figure. Seeking the Soul, you'll remember him. He ran in the Belmont Stakes and has done some good things. I think Town Classic just went up against so much better horses, and he was far from embarrassed. Uh, he was four wide entering the turn. He was wide into the stretch. He tried. He was plugging on, and he finished fourth. Now he returns as a first-time gelding. There are some fast workouts on the page for a good trainer in Brian Lynch. I'm hoping the Town Classic can get a little bit of a setup in this race because I think he'll be a decent price, and, and there are enough angles to indicate to me that he's going to run well. I love that case, and I love that point you made about uh, the favorite, too, Dan. Sometimes, I mean, it's great to have a workout report, and when you can get that kind of information, that's going to give you an edge. But there are some very simple things you can do in analyzing workouts that uh, can often pay dividends. And looking for a pattern as much as a quality of a specific work or a lack thereof when it comes to a pattern, a lot of people aren't taking the time to look at it that deeply. And when you're talking about a big favorite in what could really be a competitive race that many aren't viewing as such pretty much any reason to bet against a horse under two to one you want to take. So that's a, that's a really interesting point, especially you take that, you couple it with the layoff lines and you say to yourself, Hey, maybe this is a horse that isn't super sound and, or uh, one that doesn't have to win today in what looks like a, in what looks like a competitive spot. So those are some other good uses of, and that's not formulator that you can get in the classic PPs. That's just good old school handicapping and, uh, and understanding the game. So some good ideas there. We'll talk now about race nine. This is the traditional opening day feature, the Transylvania, talking about three-year-old Colts on the green. It's the return to the races, as we mentioned up top of Oscar performance. If you project improvement since the last time we saw him on a race course, uh, these others might be in a little bit of trouble. But at the same time, we've got some later developing really interesting runners signed on here against them. What do you think, Dan? Do we expect another star turn from Oscar performance? I would expect another very good performance for Oscar performance, but I think if you just take the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf as a, as a snapshot of a running line, I, I don't think it tells the whole picture. Yes, Oscar performance won that race, and Ticonderoga was beaten almost five lengths, but Ticonderoga never had any chance once the post positions were drew and he was outside, because the only chance that, uh, that, that Rafael Bejarano had was to take him immediately down to the rail and Sort of like, imagine Gunnar is run on the Florida Derby, breaking from the outside post. He was immediately taken back to last. That trip's not going to work out. He must have swung about eight wide in the stretch. Ticonderoga kicks like a mule, and, and I think that he's going to run some very, very nice races here at three. But this might simply be a case of a comparable, if not better, horse with tactical speed getting the jump, and pace makes the race. And we look at the pace projector in Time Form U.S., favors horse on near the early lead. Oscar performance, if he breaks, is likely to make the front. And Ticonderoga, the number five, is likely to be lagging near the back of the pack. I think these horses have comparable ability. I think Oscar performance's tactical ability gives him a major edge. There are some promising runners in here, to be sure, but I think it's those two uh, with most of my weight going on the pace horse Oscar performance. Makes, Makes sense, sense to me to, to press a little, a little bit when it comes, comes to that. To that. Um, um, let's, let's move, move on, on now, now to, to the, the nightcap. Night I'm trying to figure this, this out where I can, where I can answer, answer some of the, some of the nice questions, questions that we have, that we have people, people are coming in, in, but I'm having a little bit of trouble with my second screen. That's why you heard that echo for a second, but I got rid of that. We should be okay. Uh Love the nightcap, you know, it's it's always, especially when you're at the track, um, so many times it all comes down to this race to paraphrase our friend and mentor, Harvey Pack. This is the race that decides whether you'll be buying rounds for all your friends at Malone's or slumming it with us at the Chick-fil-A on Manowar mm -hmm. Boulevard. Dan, who's going to get us out? Boy, I'd hope it's the three heartbreak hill. And I know uh, she's only one for 12 lifetime, but I, I, I kind of am willing to give her another chance. They're putting the blinkers on again. Now, she's raced twice with blinkers in the past, but one was over a wet track and one was over a, a, a turf course. 
I wonder, I, I think the jury's still out. While her dirt form isn't great, I think the jury's still out as to whether she can run on dirt. I think she can, especially at this level. I mean, she's dropping down to the $20,000 non-winners of two life. Her last race was actually okay at Turfway Park. I think this is a horse that you should use. I think the seven Bayshore Drive is a horse that's worth some consideration as well, because at least Bayshore Drive has run well on the dirt and has a little bit of tactical ability in these low-profile connections almost to sure a price. But the horse I'm interested in your take on is the number four, Stella Nova, a horse that debuted at Mahoning Valley, ran off the screen at three to ten, and is at seven to ten, and is now uh, at uh, with the big girls at Keeneland. It, that's one where you've got a few different tools to check out. One would be taking a look at uh, has Kellen Gorder had success uh, locally at Keeneland, and and I and I don't know uh, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Let's do a quick uh, find out. Go to use today's track. And we'll see in general how he's done. And it's eye-poppingly good um, in the complete sample. So that starts to give you a little bit of confidence when you see a trainer who's uh, got that plus ROI um, with all starters. 14 and 38, not exactly the greatest numbers in the history of the world, but that, that 205 ROI makes you think, all right, he's done put some horses in that the market didn't necessarily respond to and have done very well. Another thing to take a look at would be uh, the time form uh, product to see how the horse stacks up when it comes to when it comes to pace figures. So we'll take a look at that now, um, and we'll click on this horse and see where where we fit. We see maybe the the, the very the, the very low sixty nine uh, early on suggests this could be a very different game. Um, but when you look at the pace projector, that's still enough to, to, to be clear of this field. I think this is a horse you have to use at least defensively. What did you, what was your conclusion when it came to Stella Nova then? I'm using Stella Nova simply because that pace projector is fairly striking, isn't it? I mean, yes. she got away to an easy lead. My concern was maybe she would face stronger pace pressure as she faces stronger horses. But if you believe in this pace projector, it's possible that Stella Nova uh, will be out there. You mentioned Kellen Goyer is a high percentage winning trainer. Stella Nova just seems to be placed right. This is a, a nice spot for a non-winners of two life. I'd use her. I'd use Heartbreak Hill the three. I'd use uh, Base Shore Drive the seven. And in situations with low-level claimers, a lot of times you just pray. Uh, Kirby's Penny, the 11, is at 4-1. to one. I'm not sure if I really want to take a short price on this filly who's trying dirt now in her fifth start. It's almost like Wesley Ward's throwing his hands up and saying, well, well, maybe she'll run on the dirt. But I think if you ask Wesley, is she going to love the dirt? He'd say, I don't know. And I'm not sure I don't want to take. I don't know it. Four to one or three to one in a race like this. <laughs> it is interesting looking at the breeders' ratings. They do give some reason to do it, but I, but I tend to I tend to see it the same way that you do with uh, the that it, it seems like more of a throwing up the hands in a horse because of the famous connections is gonna get bet. But I don't know. Depending on how I was constructing my ticket, um, seeing these breeding ratings might make me think about an inclusion at least the the C level. Uh, it doesn't seem like a total toss, but. I agree. It's hard to have a lot of confidence. It just doesn't seem like uh, the game, the, the way that he usually plays the game. Um, so there you have it. A bunch of thoughts on Keeneland's opening day card. We have some questions here. I think I can access them this way. You'll just have to look at me looking at the questions, which is slightly awkward, but um, we're, we're, we're just going to we're just going to do it. Uh, we'll get to as many of these as we can over the course of the next five minutes. If we don't get a chance uh, to answer these questions, I'll try to answer them subsequently. Um, Dan, you can help me answer these. Here's the first one from Jim O'Neill. He asks this question every year leading into the Derby. In fields of 14 or more, how important is the jockey in terms of putting the horse in a position to win? Are there jockeys who have a set method of directing horses? In other words, they, the same running style. Um, why don't you take a crack at that one? I, I try to stay away from jockeys. Uh, I think they're one of the most overrated handicapping uh factors out there. Uh, I, I think that if you put Javier Castellano on a guy that's a trainer that's 0 for 100 and has that sort of stock at Finger Lakes, his winning percentage will decrease uh, dramatically. And if you take a guy that's riding 
low level claimers at Finger Lakes that are 100 to 1, but as a competent jockey and you ride for Todd Fletcher, his numbers are probably going to go up dramatically. I think it's the horse 95% of the time. In the Derby, I guess it's a different situation, however, because you want to have uh, someone that has an idea of pace, an idea of how to save some ground. I mean, Calvin Burrell comes to mind uh, immediately in that he's always riding the rail in the Kentucky Derby. But there are so many factors that go into handicapping three year olds for the Kentucky Derby. To me, jockeys are, are, the, are the last thing I think about. Uh, to me, all it does is it depresses your price if you see a Javier or a Jose Ortiz, and it certainly depresses your price if you see a Calvin Burrell in the Derby. I'm much more into jockeys, I think, on a day-to-day basis than, than Dan is in terms of how I use them to figure out in my mind how a race might be run. But I agree completely when it comes to the Kentucky Derby. Um, I just feel like that it, it, it's such a big deal. It'll be a very rare instance where a particular jockey uh, – I thought suited a horse more. It just seems like that race is is so much about the horse with the potential exception of a day uh, like mine, that Bird's Kentucky Derby, where you end up with a strong bias on Derby Day. In that instance, I would upgrade riders who've shown a history, and there's not that many of them, but of understanding bias and making it work to their advantage. Now, I'm not saying I used mind that bird on uh, uh, on that day. I did not. But I, if somebody had made the case to me of the ride that Calvin was going to give the horse, I might have thrown the horse in for fourth. Which, which, uh, I, so I will use it in a occasionally, but only in extreme instances for a race like the Kentucky Derby. We have another question, Dan. What about, about, about real, real quick, Pete, just to, yeah, just to, to try to add something to, to Jim's uh, question. I think he's looking for riders that maybe want to fit horses. Uh, it, for me, it's very difficult to see is this guy a speed jockey? Is this guy not a speed jockey? But by following the races at your circuit, you'll find out that a guy like Kendrick Carmouche is an astute pace rider, and if maybe he's on a horse that can be forward or a horse that can show tactical speed. You can you can depend on him to grab the bull by the horns and, 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 and ride the pace very well. Junior Alvarado is a crack turf rider. Uh, Julian Leperu, a lot of folks believe he's, he's more of a closer-oriented jockey. Give Julian Leperu a speed horse like heart to heart, and he will rate them beautifully. Maybe that's uh, more the terms of what you're looking for in the derby. Uh, a horse that a jockey will, with a certain running style and a certain sort of ability to, to be to judge pace. Several folks having some issues with the sound. I feel like it's okay now. Uh, Let us know if that was an issue. We'll try to correct it for next time. Sorry about that. We have a question about if this uh, show can be accessed subsequently once it's over. The answer is yes. This webinar, as well as lots of other good handicapping information, can be accessed at drf.com slash YouTube. That's drf.com slash YouTube. Feel free to check out the archive of this show and many others there. A couple other little handicapping tidbits we can get to before we go. What about four-year-olds versus three-year-olds in maiden races at this time of the year? Any comments, Dan? It's an interesting question. I think most handicappers just look at it and say, well, I don't want the younger horses. And I I wonder if that's a mistake, because oftentimes in these three-year-old and up maiden races, you'll have older horses that are 0 for 12 and that aren't going to show any sort of improvement. Yet these three-year-olds are coming into their own right now and jumping up, capable of jumping up four or five, maybe more buyer speed figure points a race. I would not blindly throw out three-year-olds in situations like that. I always look for upside in maiden races. And maybe you can find a little bit of value. I've been studying the Oaklawn race for a while three-year-olds hold their own and do very very well against those older runners so uh, don't don't uh don't discriminate against those young ones no ageism in those three-year-olds and up races i i I think the three-year-olds can hold their own this time of year now for me i'm not a big uh you know weight as a handicapping factor in american racing not generally something i pay a ton of attention to but i will say dan for me it would be something i'd at least glance at at this time of the year when we're looking at three-year-olds facing older horses when you've in the study you've done on this topic is that something that's that you've seen have any correlation to the results whether or not the three-year-olds are getting weight and how much I, I think it's always important, uh, especially this time of year. But uh, for me, again, I'm more important. I'm, I'm more interested in the improvement angle. Uh, weight for me is so hard to quantify. Is six pounds more? Uh, you know, obviously going to improve. How how much will six pounds improve to four or three? Uh, I, I really can't quantify that. Obviously, I love to see getting weight instead of giving it in that sort of situation. But uh, I'm more interested in the upside in these maiden races, uh, three and three and up. There, there's these four-year-olds and up. 
It's hard to imagine them just really coming into their own now. They've probably had some sort of problems that have delayed their debuts. Now they've run seven or eight times. I don't see the improvement. I think the three-year-olds have, have way more scope. I have a correction here that someone points out that the Keeneland pick six is a dollar and not 50 cents. I do believe that's right. I think I was conflating it with the pick five in my mind. So apologies for sending that little bit of uh, misinformation out into the world. I think we have time for one more handicapping question. This one is from Forrest, who is relatively new to racing. What significance in handicapping does having a horse in for a claim for the first time play in your in whether or not you choose that horse, Dan? Well, the class drop is always powerful, but formulator really helps because no two class drops are alike. I mean, you're going to see a horse sometimes dropping from one of the weakest 1Xs in the world into a solid $50,000 claiming race. That could actually be better. And I think that's where if you're using the formulator program, you click on the chart, you can see how these horses, uh, you can go into all of their past performances. Is it a true class drop? Uh, and then you have to ask yourself, why is the horse being dropped in classes? Because he simply needs weaker horses. He hasn't been running well. Or is there somewhat of a situation where where, boy, the trainer doesn't want him. He wants him out of the barn as fast as possible. I think those are the kind of horses you want to avoid. So, uh, again, that's the part of the handicap. You'd love to have a, a quick answer and, and, and a pat answer for every situation, uh, but there's not. Horses dropping in class, to me, I always, I'm always i always skeptical. I'm a pessimist. You know me. <laughs> so at the, at the end of the day, I see a horse dropping in class, and I want to know why, what's wrong with him. That's that's pretty funny. Here's another little tool you can use to assess those sort of hidden, not really class drops or hidden actual class drops. If you're a DRF Plus member, you can get a list of the buyer pars at every track. So you could potentially go in here and take a look at what the speed figure pars are at Aqueduct and see what the maiden, what, for example, a first level allowance horse runs here. And then you could compare that to Keeneland in a open $40,000 claimer. And just by looking at the average speed figures that the different horses run, you can have a sense of the relative merits of the class and whether or not it's really a drop. So thank you everybody who submitted questions. We are out of time. Um, I want to thank Dan Illman very much for coming and uh, coming in here at late notice and helping me out today and doing such a fantastic job as always. Hopefully we'll have you on here again soon, Dan. Um, you can find me if you're interested in more of my work. Uh, I'll be doing another handicapping session tomorrow with Mike Beer at 10 a.m. talking about the Wood Memorial card. You can also catch me twice a week uh, on the DRF Players podcast and hear more from me there. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in today. You've been watching a show produced by DRF.com.